Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a This Year in Perfume, and it's going to highlight an absolute all-star, epic uh, year. I would say uh, this year is a triumph in perfumery, and um, it's, it's going to be a ranked This Year in Perfume. It's actually going to be a top 22, so I've got a lot of fragrances in my collection from 1987. What a year, honestly. Uh, I think you guys will be stunned at the quality and the quantity, uh, but really the quality, every single fragrance in this list to me is a banger, what I would consider a banger. Uh, even number 22, which is $7 a bottle, it's fantastic. Uh, one of the best cheapies money can buy, all the way to, to number one. Now, a couple things about these ranked videos that I do. So the first thing is that this is just my personal opinion, and it's just my personal opinion when I made the video, which is... Uh, Saturday, May 20th of 2023. Obviously, if you ask me tomorrow, this could be completely different. Uh, also, it is, it is just my preference, okay? So I'm not saying that number one is a better fragrance than number 20, or number two is a better fragrance than number 18, or whatever it may be. Uh, this is just my preference, how I would rank them right now in terms of my favorites to wear. That's all this is. It's a fun way to sort of talk about a lot of different fragrances, which is what this channel is all about documenting my journey, how I feel about a fragrance, and talking about fragrances with you. And I think this is a fun way to do it, to break it down by year. And the 80s is sort of my decade. So we are dead smack in the heart of Ram territory. And uh, the flag is planted deep on this one, I'll tell you that much. So let's start with what was going on in 1987. So first of all, uh, a couple of main events. Uh, so some headlines from 1987. It says that uh, the one of the most talked about headlines in 1987 was the conviction of a notorious war criminal, Nicholas Barbie, for war crimes during World War II. The very first appearance of the show The Simpsons happened. Think about that. That was 1987. I was two years old. Um, Margaret Thatcher's retention of her role as Prime Minister of Britain for her third term in a row. And uh, in the financial news, basically Black Monday happened on uh, October 19th, 1987, which is when the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 22.6% in one day. The biggest drop on record, I think, ever for one day. Um, and there were some other smaller things, like, for example, they say that... Uh, uh, Intifada begins, that uh, riots break out in Hajj. Uh, that the USS Stark was hit by Exocet missile. Reagan and Gorbachev meet in Washington. Think about the political landscape back then. Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev um, met in Washington. And uh, Libyan troops were driven out of Chad and India invades Pakistan. So um, also the first version of Microsoft Excel was released in 1987. How crazy is that? Um, and... Um, let's see, apparently it says fueled by, um, the Iran-Iraq war, one of the longest interstate conflicts of the 20th century spread into the Persian Gulf in 1987. So, 87 was an interesting year, um, and it was a fantastic year for perfumes as far as I'm concerned. Let's do scent of the day first before we really hop into fragrances that were created in the year 1987 that I have in my collection. So, scent of the day... This is actually thanks to my good friend, Hari, who uh, has been extremely fair and he's really stocked me up on fragrances I've I would have never been able to smell if not for his kindness. Uh, yesterday I wore Roja's Black Tear, which I forgot to talk about whenever I did my um, raw gold video. That was the only video I did yesterday. And this was actually my scent of the day yesterday. It was called H the Exclusive Black Tear. And you know what's funny about this is it smells almost identical to O, oh, the exclusive Parfum, which I have a video on the channel. And if you go look at the note listings, uh, if you think I'm joking, go pull up the note listings for O, oh, the exclusive Parfum, and pull up the note listing for H, the exclusive Black Tear, and look at the two note listings. They are almost identical. I mean, uh, the base notes have some different notes here and there. I think this has iris and that one doesn't, or the other one has amiris and this one doesn't, but really it's, they smell so similar. I would have, I would have a hard time picking them out, let's say, um, 
comparing the, the differences. And that's a problem. You know, when you spend this much money on a fragrance, you expect to have just be completely blown away. And while I do like the fragrance, I, I think in, you know, just pure smell form, what, what you're smelling, the scent itself, it is nice. The fact that he makes a fragrance that smells very similar to another fragrance and is charging this kind of money, uh, it's a little iffy to me. You expect to always be blown away. And obviously, um, there is a there is a culture of just trying to sell bottles around this house sometimes and recycling um, fragrances, you know, recycling a fragrance and changing one or two things. It's not exactly a recycle because there are some things that are changed, but they're so close that maybe, you know, a frag head uh, who really knows the the uh, history of the house and what has been put out would, would instantly be able to pick it up. And I, I do think that can be a little bit of a problem, but I did enjoy wearing this yesterday. I'll do a full review on H the exclusive black tier. I think they discontinued O the exclusive parfum. So I think this is the only one that's left if I'm, uh, if I am not mistaken. Anyways, that was my scent of the day yesterday. Today, I'm wearing another scent that Hari supplied me with. And this is actually the very first time I've worn anything from this house. Uh, the house itself is called Fong Dang. And you can see her signature right there, Fong Dang. And this is called Untamed Oud. So I don't hate the bottle. The bottle's not bad. The sprayer is absolutely immense. It's like a, it's like a Roja sprayer where you can sort of really control the sprays. And um, even though the cap doesn't click into place, you know, you can pick it up by the cap, but it's... You saw what happened there. I mean, enough weight and it'll just sort of come off. But um, uh, the brand itself, I don't know what's going on with this brand, to be honest with you. This is the very first one from the house that I've smelled. There's two perfumers that worked with this designer. Her name is um, Fong Dang, obviously. And basically, uh, her story is that uh, she did a collaboration with these two perfumers, Mark Buxton and Bertrand Duchafort, who did Untamed Oud. Uh, and they combine art and science to create a collection of olfactory poems, true works of art, striking in both their originality and their beauty. Inspired by Fong's original and artistic perfume concepts, which seek to capture human spirit in liquid form, these master perfumers and Fong together were exceptionally high concentrations of the most precious raw materials into unique harmonies that can only tr that can truly transform our feelings and transport us to realms rarely visited by modern perfumery. So I think that this collection is no longer available. That's my guess because you can actually go to her website, fongdang.com, and you can click on the scents themselves and you can read about them, but you actually can't buy them. It won't let you actually place an order to buy the scent. There's nowhere to buy it. Um, and I think these were exclusives when they came out to Barney's, if I'm not mistaken. I think when Barney's went through some hard times, especially, I think, um, maybe COVID pushed them over the edge or they went bankrupt right before COVID. I don't know what happened with Barney's, but um, I think maybe once they went under, it pulled this brand under. That's my guess. It's a little bit of a weird deal. You have a website up, but you can't actually buy the perfume. But if you search for them, you'll see them being offered on like Walmart and Amazon for like 70, 140 bucks. I thought these were like $300 fragrances at Barney's. I, I don't know what's going on with the house. But um, Untamed Oud says, challenge and change, climbing through the dark, unknown world with a curious mind. Adrenaline burns through your veins, brave without fear, conquering doubts, challenge and change. So um, the fragrance itself is um, it's not an oud fragrance that's going to wow an oud head, okay? So that's the first thing you have to get out of, out, out of the way. If you're approaching this fragrance from trying to break it down by smelling real oud and that kind of thing, you're going to be disappointed. But if you go in expecting to know that there is, you know, this oud accord in here, that's what I think it is. I think uh, Bertrand Duchafort is very good at building this oud accord out of, you know, modern synthetics. Uh, and it's Bertrand Duchafort. I mean, the guy to me is an absolute brilliant mastermind fragrance producer. And what he did here is he used tar, rum, cumin, and coriander seeds in the top. So it does open up very oily and resinous and tar-like. But pretty soon you're going to get kind of the woods and the spices. There's a little hint of fruit with apple. And, and um, there's this honey aspect to the to the spicy. And the floral, the, the sort of spicy floral heart is also slightly honeyed, which I do like. 
and the base is Oud, Tobacco, Oak Moss, Tonka Bean Absolute, Vanilla Absolute, Ambergris, Atlas Cedar, Musk, and Cipriol. And many of these fragrances, even the new Roja Taif Oud, um, you know, it, it smells like Cipriol. If you ever smelled Cipriol, you'll kind of have an idea. And that's what a lot of these Oud Accords are used with patchouli, patchoulol, Cipriol, these other uh, ingredients like that. And then, of course, the um, main captive molecules of the big oil houses, um, you know, black oud and norlimbanol and these other ingredients that create this oud accord or whatever you want to call it. And that's sort of what you get here. But you know what? I don't think it's shite. I like this. Um, but you have to approach it from the side of Versace, Porom, oud noir, Tom Ford, oud wood. You know, look at it from that lens. Don't look at it and um, compare this to a Bortnikoff or a Aris La Dore or an Ensar, you will be disappointed. But is it shite? No, I don't think it is. I think it's pretty good. I think it's, um, um, I've enjoyed wearing it today, let's say. But um, I um, I also really like Bertrand Duchefort's work though. So I, you know, I have no problem with this. But uh, yes, this is Untamed Oud. I'll do a full review on this one day soon. Okay, so let's talk about um, today's top 22. So this is going to be a hell of a video. These are all-star scents. And, and once you start getting into it, you're going to see it's very hard to make decisions on where to put things because they're all amazing fragrances. Some of my all-time favorites are in this list. Um, so number 22 is actually here because of the um, because of the value for money and uh, this obviously could have been higher if you're if you're somebody that uh, wants to have that smell of the of the 80s I get a ton of dihydromersinol in this I get a ton of that sort of fresh um, 80s um, you know fougere that fresh fougere from the 80s that was so popular with things like Dracar Noir and stuff like that this is basically a a clone of Dracar Noir, and many of the clones from the 80s, I, I believe, even though they had GCMS technology back then, a lot of times the perfumer would literally just smell it and try and recreate his own accord back then. Uh, they didn't do what Dua and uh, Alexandria fragrances are doing where they stick it under a GCMS machine and try to copy exactly what... They didn't do that. Um, you know, I think the perfumer just sort of uh, I did the eyeball test, if you will, or the nose test. And what it comes out coming up to the forefront is that you have a fragrance that smells very similar to what the for what the um, house is trying to clone, but it almost smells like a flanker of, of the house, of, of the fragrance that's being cloned, if that makes sense. So uh, Dracar Noir came out in 82. This came out in 87, and it's uh, Lomani Porom. And again, very hard to put this at number 22 because this is such a great value for money fragrance. One of the absolute best $7 I think I've ever spent on a fragrance. It is fantastic for 7 bucks. And if you like that fresh woody fougere, slightly camphorous, slightly clovey, um, but it's got that true proper fougere DNA uh, with the lavender, bergamot, geranium, and that kumarin, that tonka bean kumarin in the base with that old school moss and... Um, and patchouli, and I mean, look, for a $7 fragrance, I mean, look at the detail. It's um, it's good stuff. This is a good fragrance, and don't let the blue, you know, this came out in 87, when the the wave of things like cool water, and, um, you know, there was um, New West by Aramis, were, were just starting to really take hold, right? And so even though they, they've made this blue sort of... Um, juice color and representation. This is not a blue fragrance. This is a uh, green fougere that is much more in competition with things like Dracar Noir uh, to, to my nose. Okay, so that's number 22 on the list. Number 21. Number 21 is a uh, fragrance from the house of Arrogance, Arrogance, and um, this is called Womo. So this is another sort of um, fougere, but it goes in a little different direction. Um, it uh, brings in more heavier, sort of woodier, um, also slightly leathery accords because the base has a castorium note, which I absolutely love castorium, and but it does it in that fougere DNA that was very popular in the 80s. Um, you'll get the uh, aldehydes mixed with lavender and green artemisia, and it's sort of that green artemisia, heavier, 
uh, spicier, leatherier bit that makes me sort of give it the nod over Lomani Poron. These these were sort of um, sparring for the final spot, if you will. And I ended up putting Lomani Poron at the back of the train because uh, this one has some of those features that I like a little bit more. I think it's still a proper fougere, but um, they've made it in this sort of um, uh, aromatic leather type vibe with some heavier, deeper, darker, spicy, woody green touches that are just a little heavier than Lomani Porom. Lomani Porom focuses more on the freshness. You know, dihydromercenol is a very fresh smelling ingredient. And um, uh, this very well may have a little bit of dihydromercenol, but nowhere near as much as um, Lomani Porom. And so that's why this gets the nod to me because I just like the this is actually a um, older version. It's a Schiaparelli version. Now these are marketed by a company called First, or The First, excuse me, The First. So this is an older bottle, but it's not a true proper vintage. I think there was an even older uh, distributor before uh, Pekens Schiaparelli, or Schiaparelli Pekens. So I think there was an even older distributor, but don't don't hold my feet to the fire there. I'm not 100% sure. So that is number 21. Number 20 is our first women's fragrance on the list, but definitely not the last. The women's fragrances actually um, dominate this list. They they beat lots of my favorite men's fragrances because they're just so the, so damn good. One of the best years for women's fragrances, in my opinion. But this one's closer to the back just because... Um, it, uh, I have, well, first of all, I need to spend more time with it, but from what I have, uh, sprayed it, I think it's a beautiful, proper, spicy, uh, floral Shepra, okay? And it was done by Fermanish. Fermanish created this fragrance. Now, Parfumo says 1987. If you go to Base Notes or I think some of the other sites, they actually listed it 1985 or 86, 85, 86. So there's a little bit of a, uh, disagreement immediately as to what year this fragrance was released, but I'm gonna stick with Parfumo since that's what I've been using for the longest amount of time. Also, one thing I should mention, if you go to Parfumo and you look in Parfumo, you'll notice that in 1987, they list this fragrance as an 87 release. Uh, Smalto. Um, this is, um, what do they call this? I forgot the name, let's see. This is, uh, sorry, give me one sec, I'll tell you, I'll tell you for sure. So they call this one, Smalto by Francesco Smalto. And they list it as a 1987 release. It's not, it's a 1997 release. They fat fingered, um, they, they basically gave it a decade earlier. And if you go watch my, I have a, um, I actually have a, um, a unboxing on the channel from my time in Houston when I bought this from one of the perfume houses in Houston. And uh, it was called Perfume Planet. If you go to my Perfume Planet unboxing, you'll find it. But um, I, I did an early impression of this and I sprayed it on. I was like, I cannot believe this is from 1987. It doesn't smell like 87 at all. And as it turned out, um, Parfumo was wrong. So I did not include this because I know this is actually from 97, but now I, I really risk forgetting about this when I get to my 97 video. Anyways, just a little housekeeping note there. Just know that if you're looking through Parfumo's directory of perfumes released in that year, that's not actually a, a true statement that it's that Francesco Smalto's Smalto is released in, in 87. Um, but this one is, or at least I think it's closer to the true date than, um, than, than small toe, so I left it I left it in there. But it's basically a spicy Shepra that has coriander, aldehydes, bergamot, cardamom, mandarin orange, rosewood, lemon, uh, geranium, carnation, rose, cypress, ylang ylang, jasmine, lily of the valley, amber, spices, leather, musk, sandalwood, cedarwood, tonka, uh, oak moss, patchouli, and vanilla. Hell of a note listing. And if you know anything about sort of women's fragrances from this decade, you'll realize instantly how brilliant this is. This is a beautiful, fantastic Shepra. And that's why I say it's so hard to, to sort of rank these. Um, just that ex expensive, spicy Shepra aroma that really, you know, um, it, it uh, transitions well. 
It seems like the ingredients are of the highest quality. They just, uh, one of the best Fendi fragrances for women and they discontinued it, of course. But uh, if you can find an older bottle like this, this is, this is really good stuff. Okay, so that was number 20. Number 19 is a masculine fragrance from the house of Basile. And it's actually called Basile Uomo. So one thing I will tell you is some people will try to tell you that Oh, if you have the uh, um, if you have the Waruska and Joel version, that you don't have the right version. Um, you can see the short ingredient list right here, so you know that it's old enough to wear. Um, it's vintage enough before Ifra's guidelines sort of came in and started to limit oak moss and stuff like that. And um, they'll tell you if you don't have the Serpe version the S-I-R-P-E-A version that you don't have the original one, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I would say get either version that you can find. Whatever you can get that's the cheapest, do it. Like, I, I got a tester, I gave up the cap, um, and I'm very happy with this. This is a very interesting fragrance. Um, basically, Basile Uomo is sort of like this green, spicy uh, Chypre. Okay, so I find some similarities to... Uh, if you ever smelled Jacques Bogart Signature from 1975, there's some similarities there, but this also brings it into the 80s. Um, it uses some very fresh lavender and some fruits, and so you're going to get citruses like grapefruit, tangerine, lemon with basil and rosemary, and that basil-rosemary com combination will give you a little hint of a fougere from long ago, Paco Rabanne Pour Homme. There's little hints of Paco Rabanne Pour Homme in here, even though this is a Chypre. That's why I say uh, I think it, it has, it's kind of like the ghost uh, of, of, um, of the future as far as Jacques Bogart uh, uh, signature, or the, or it's just called Bogart, but everyone calls it signature because the name, the way the name is written on the front of the bottle, it looks like it's written with a pen. Um, here it is. So if you've seen, if you if you've tried this from 1975, this is sort of a blend of like a Chypre and a Fougere to me, and this kind of follows in a very similar footsteps, but it does it with an 80s tilt okay so it's got this um clove note that will remind you a little bit of the way that a lot of those 80 fragrances use clove and it's got some black currant and it's got some green galbanum so um it's it's sort of walking that line between even in 87 this felt like a little bit of a vintage fragrance but they tried to do some things to modernize it but if you like things like Paco Rabanne Pour Homme if you like uh, Jacques Bogart, Bogart, I would highly encourage you to check out Basile Uomo. Some people were trying to tell me that even the modern version is very good. I've um, I've never smelled the, the the modern version. The '87 version is officially discontinued, um, but um, but yes, I do hear that even the modern version is still quite nice. But yeah, Basile Uomo, this is good stuff. That's the kind of stuff that I like to wear. Okay, that was number 19. Number 18 is, uh, again, very hard to rank this. This easily could have been higher because I am enamored with this fragrance. I think it's such an amazing release for what it was in um, 1987. And uh, apparently now it's being marketed by somebody completely different. So I don't know what the most modern bottle is, but this is called Caesar's Man. So you can see these older bottles, I thought the older ones said Legendary Cologne Spray, and the newer ones say um, Cologne. I, 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 I'm not 100% sure, but I can tell you, if you look on the bottom of my bottle, it says Caesars Entertainment Inc. And um, now, if you go to Parfumo, it actually shows that... Um, it is being marketed by Palm Beach Beauty. I don't see Palm Beach Beauty on here. So I'm guessing this is an older bottle. I don't know how old, though. Um, I think the really, really old bottles actually had, like, the the notes on the back. Or, or like, uh, it, it said, like, alcohol and parfum or something. But I'm not 100% sure. Oh. But this also has a little bit of Dracar Noir. And, of course, a little bit of Lomani. Um, pour homme, but this feels a little more high class to me, okay? It also feels like they use the right color for the juice, okay? This is a little bit of psychological, I think, a uh, little bit of marketing on Lomani's part. But uh, this this is what this fragrance feels like. It's a green, fresh, uh, spicy fougere 
with, again, that very 80s dihydromersinol freshness, if you will. And if you smelled things like uh, Duc de Vervins, if you've smelled, um, if you've smelled things like um, Dracar Noir, like we mentioned earlier, those are all great examples of sort of the style that uh, this is issued in. It's got rosemary, bergamot, and vervain with geranium, lavender, and fir balsam, amber, oak moss, patchouli, and sandalwood. And it's just such a, it's such a um, just up and down, proper, classic, uh, fresh 80s fougere that uh, you can't help but if you like this style of fragrance and you smell this, you, you can't help but like it. I mean, you, um, you can't help but fall under its spell. It's very hard to dislike this if you like this style of fragrance. Mm, very good. Some people will say it has a little bit of a pissy vibe to it, but actually, I don't. I don't mind. I don't mind that at all. I don't mind the um, the sort of uh, lavender that's so herbal it can almost come across as a little bit pissy. But uh, but I'm a fan. I am. Uh, I'm definitely a definitely a fan. Uh, and and. Love the packaging too. It's just fantastic. So Caesars, man, good stuff. Okay, next on the list is a fragrance I actually have a full review on the channel. I haven't reviewed many of my full bottle fragrances. That's on the on the to do list. This is one that instantly got an early impression video because I only had a mini, so I didn't have very much. But uh, it's from 1987, of course. All of these are. And this is from the house of Pacoma, Pacoma, uh, and it's, so it's from the house of Pacoma, and it's called Gatsby. And I actually, again, have a full review on the channel or an early impression video. If you want to go sort of hear my thoughts on Gatsby, you can. Uh, so uh, if you've smelled MCM Success... Or almost like a continuation of Boss Number no. One. Boss Number no. One came out in '85. MCM Success came out in '86. Gatsby came out in '87. And um, Gatsby, I want you to imagine sort of the um, almost like the most deep, spicy honey that you can imagine. Uh, if you've ever heard of, you know, this royal honey, the honey that they feed the the, the queen bee. Um, and this sort of, ex this sort of, uh, the extreme sort of, uh, I think they call it royal jelly, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, there's something, just from memory, there's something just extremely, uh, deep feeling about Gatsby. It, it has this, uh, this depth to the honey, almost like you're smelling honey with resins and ambers, if that makes sense. So imagine like this ambery resinous, spicy, deep, thick, uh, syrupy honey. Almost if honey could be syrup you put on pancake, like that very thick resinous honey. Uh, and you would think that kind of honey would be too sweet for me. It's not here. It's not. The way that they did it, uh, that's the way I like my sweetness. So I actually just did a uh, review on a fragrance called Thomas DeMonico Raw Gold. I consider it a little bit of a hype beast because I hear about it all the time in the community now. People uh, talk about it. They ask me to talk about it. And uh, the sweetness in there was just hard for me to accept. It was uh, that that sort of modern sweetness gets to me. This doesn't. If I'm going to wear a sweet fragrance, I would much rather it be something like this or MCM Success or something like that. So uh, Gatsby by Pacoma. Fantastic. There's also a little bit of this fruity side. There's like this fruity, resinous, um, spicy, deep honey. It's, it's amazing. If you like MCM success, check out Gatsby. Okay. Next on the list, we have number, that was number 17. So we have number 16. Number 16 on the list is a Pure Bourdon creation. And the reason that this gets the nod over Caesar's man, and you can see they both sort of went with a very similar juice color and you know because of the way that the fragrance makes 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 you feel i think they i think they hit the color on the head uh, but there's some there's definitely some similarities between caesar's man and jill sanders man 3 so jill sanders man 3 is sort of a spicy fresh again fougere and it's very similar to caesar's man or lamani porom um, that sort of style right but the difference with this the reason that it gets the nod to me is that Pierre Bourdon um, 
did his usual magic. And what he ended up doing here is he added this um, sort of fruitiness that you'll get. And I have no clue what fruits it is. But imagine smelling like a fruit cocktail by Pierre Bourdon. And sometimes you get this... Uh, Sometimes you get this pear, sometimes you get this um, cherry feel, sometimes you get this apple, sometimes you get this like fruit cocktail, right? This this uh, pineapple, right? This pineapple. Um, and maybe there's no pineapple here. Maybe I'm just uh, imparting my thoughts for the future onto Jill Sanders' Man 3, but it's like a fruit cocktail, right? Uh, with that traditional, proper, spicy, fresh fougere. Uh, mugwort, lavender, coriander, rosemary, and bergamot with thyme, fruits, juniper, rose, carnation, oak moss, cedar, sandalwood, frankincense, musk, and patchouli. And I just, I love the heft of this and I love sort of the little, um, the details that Pierre Bourdon sort of wove into Jill Sander Man 3. So if, if you don't like these type of fragrances, you won't like this. This will be a, this will be a note for you. If you think these smell cheap, this will be a no for you. But if you like this style of perfumery or the Dracar Noirs, Lomani Pour Homes, you'll like this. This is this is good stuff. Um, Jill Sander Man 3. Okay, next on the list is going to be, and you can see um, many of the proper fougeres are a little pushed to the back of the list for whatever reason. But uh, we'll, you'll see exactly what is pushed to the top of the list here very soon. But uh, many of these, I think, share some similarities. And I think it's also true with this one, released in 1987. This is the vintage uh, Cologne version. They, they stuck with the EDT version for much longer after the Cologne was discontinued. Now, rumor is, even the EDT of this is discontinued. So the whole uh, line is discontinued. And the other fragrance that this house was really known for is also discontinued. So this is from the house of Jeffrey Bean. And this is called Bowling Green. And again, this is the Cologne Spray. This is the original. Um, if you look at the distributor, you'll and if you know sort of uh, distributors gone by, you'll know that this is an 80s bottle. This is probably from when it was released or a year or two after. Um, this is lemon, juniper, basil, and bergamot with artemisia, cinnamon, lavender, pine, cardamom, and jasmine. And to me, that pine note separates this. So many of the... Um, many of the other, you know, fougeres we're discussing, uh, they're trying to recreate the smell of that fern, but they don't want to go full on pine reminder of polo green from the late seventies. So a lot of, I've noticed a lot of them sort of ignore that note. They don't want to bring in that much of a green, uh, touch. Bowling Green did its own thing and they've added moss, cedar, uh, fir, amber, patchouli, and sandalwood. And when you blend that Artemisia with pine and there's little touches of cardamom and jasmine in here, it is just a great fragrance for a beautiful spring or summer day for me. You know, this is the kind of stuff that I want to wear in the heat. Bowling Green is, um, you know, Chris from Scentland said, if you've ever seen like a green felt on a pool table, that's the feeling of this fragrance. Well, if you look at the color of the atomizer, uh, that'll sort of give you an idea of just how green this fragrance is. It is very, very green, but there's something also very vintage 80s about it too. There's that fresh vintage 80s, not as fresh as uh, the previous ones we were discussing, not as fresh as Jill Sanders Man 3 or Caesars Man. It doesn't have that amount of freshness. And so maybe this was still seen as a little vintage because I added that pine and it doesn't have as much of that freshness. Um, there's some there's some heavier notes in here too. I mentioned cinnamon and cardamom, and so the and amber and patchouli. So there is some heftier notes, but uh, all in all, this is a green fougere for the warm weather, in in my opinion. Okay, so that was number uh, fifteen. Number fourteen, staying with the warm weather. Staying with the warm weather. This is a fragrance that. Uh, me and Rich Mitch and Jonathan secured the last three bottles from this site. We each got one. And uh, we did a live stream on my channel. If you go to um, my live streams and you and you scroll through, it's the one with the, there's three ducks, three rubber ducks doing this on the front. That's the live stream where we talk about this. But this is uh, Estee Lauder's Metropolis. Whoops. Let's try that again. 
This is Este Lauder's Metropolis. So Metropolis is a long lost flanker of uh, Lauder for Men. And Lauder for Men is a fantastic fragrance rumor that is being discontinued as well. But uh, Metropolis is also a spicy sort of fresh fougere, but they did it differently. Uh, Estee Lauder's Metropolis smells nothing like this style of DNA that I was talking about earlier. Even though it's technically in the same category, it's in its own little realm. It's its own little creation. And that's what makes it unique. It has a beautiful green, fresh peppermint lavender opening. And you will get little hints of what, um, of what, uh, Louder for Men was, okay? So, uh, there's little hints of the original Louder for Men in Metropolis to me, uh, but this goes in a little bit different direction because it, it, it adds this lovely, almost sparkly, fresh ambergris note as you, as you get into the, um, into the dry down. And uh, you get that sweaty clary sage with geranium. Um, I can smell the, um, you know, I can, I can sort of smell that leathery, uh, sparkly base feeling when I, when I just smell it from the, from the bottle itself. Um, maybe a touch of that freshness, man, that, uh, that peppermint, usually you don't get fresh notes when you smell from an atomizer, usually you get base notes, but in a splash, sometimes you get more, I think, of, of the top. And I can smell a little bit of that peppermint with uh, patchouli, amber, vetiver, leather, and musk. It's just a, um, you know, you could also, I think you could also wear just louder for men in the, um, in, in the heat. But what they've done is they've sort of toned down that, um, that green galbanum opening that, uh, that makes it smell even more vintage to me. And they freshened it up a little bit, but not using the same materials that some of these other houses are using. And so this did not do well. This actually flopped. I think this was a sales flop when it came out. But man, as a summer fragrance, this to me uh, competes with the Creed's. Okay, so if you like the way that Creed sort of does that fresh sandalwood, you know, ambergris, easy to wear, sparkliness, you'll love Metropolis. Uh, very hard to find now, but uh, if you find a bottle at a fair price, I, I would say... Go for it. It is, uh, it, it is very, very good. Enjoyed getting to know this. And I'll do, I'll do a full review one of these days. Okay, next on the list is going to be uh, a fragrance that was almost higher. And some, some of you folks may be surprised that it's this, um, this low on, on the totem pole. Uh, easily, it could have been higher to me. But um, it is a Balenciaga fragrance. All right. So it's a Balenciaga fragrance from 1987, and it is called, let's see if I can get logged back in, sorry, the system kicked me out. Come on, baby, do it on the fly. Yeah. All right, so this is called Ho Hang Club. Ho Hang Club. Now, there's another... Um, I should have grabbed my other bottle. It's under lock and key. But there's a, um, there is a second version of this, if you will, that was called um, like it was called. Um, I'm trying to see. I think it was like uh, Le Club de Balenciaga. Um. Yeah, there was uh, there was a second version of this, and it's basically it's in a bottle that looks identical to this. Okay, but the name is a little bit different. I don't remember exactly what it is. I think it's like Le Club something, but uh, those are the same fragrance, just for different markets. Okay, apparently Ho Hang in some parts of the world meant something dirty. Okay, so they didn't want to put that name out there. So when they marketed it to different parts of the of the world. Um, they actually changed the, the, the name of the bottle is what it was, but it's the exact same fragrance. So if you see a fragrance that says, I'm trying to see if I can find a quick example. This might be it. This might be it. Hmm. 
Yeah, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to check on on my bottle in my safe. I'll put it. I'll put it in the description. Is what I'll do. I will put it in the uh, description along, like in parentheses, next to Ho Hang Club. Um, but it does. There, you will find two different bottles. Just know that if it looks like this and it's black, it's this one. If it's see through, like. Um, you can see the juice and it's red. That's the first version. That's that's Balenciaga Ho Hang. That's not Ho Hang Club. That's a completely different fragrance. Just uh, just FYI. So Ho Hang is basically a spicy woody sheepra. Okay, so it's earthy and it is has a deep dark rose, almost um, um, almost like this haunting rose. It's leathery, it's earthy, it's got orse root and patchouli. The patchouli is extremely prominent here with musk. And there's a little bit of lemon when you first spray. Um, you also get some artemisia, coriander, basil, old school carnation. But that rose, man, that rose geranium with the orris um, and this sort of um, very deep, dark, leathery feel that they, they basically created this deep dark leather mixed with uh, patchouli and this uh, Styrax olibanum amber base, which makes it, um, um, it makes it very, uh, you know, if you look at the bottle and you, you see how you can't see the juice, see how thick and dark the bottle makes the fragrance out to be? It is that. It's exactly that. It's this deep, dark, oily uh, leather, ambery, oily leather in a, in a sheep form. So it's very... You know, there's a lot of transitions. It's very, it, it's complex for people who like complexity. You'll like this fragrance. This is, um, this is good stuff. I have a backup of, uh, of this fragrance, and the backup is the other bottle. I wish I would have grabbed it so I could show you both. Um, is this it? Yes, it is. Oh no, it's not. Um, I keep seeing. I think, I think the other one was actually called Le Club. De Balenciaga. I think that's what it. I think that's what it is. If I'm going off of memory, but I'll I'll put it in the uh, in the comments. So Ho Hang Club comes in at number thirteen. Number twelve. Number twelve. I actually wore as my scent of the day uh, on Wednesday of this of this last week, and um, it is a, a true under the radar gem, literally, and it's called Gem by the House of Van Cleef and Arpels. And if you like things like, for example, if you like Rochas Femme by Edmund Runitska from 1947, oh, if you like opium, if you like Dior's Poison, if those are the type of fragrances that you absolutely love, you have to put this on the to sniff list. It is so damn good. Um... It, it's, I can't believe more people don't talk about it. I hardly have ever even heard of this fragrance until uh, a bottle fell in my lap, thanks to my good friend Cullen. And uh, he actually sent me a decant of it, and I was blown away. I was like, I need a bottle of this. The fruits, the plum, the peach, the, the rosewood, it's a very decadent fragrance. Um, there's a, there's a oriental... It's almost like an oriental Shepra, so it's almost like a precursor to MDCI Shepra Palaton. You know how there's that Shepra structure, but also this heavy oriental uh, presence, right? It's all here with clove, carnation, ylang ylang, iris, orris root. Even though there's tuberose in here, I still have no problem wearing it. No problem wearing it at all. Um, oak moss, vetiver, amber, civet, patchouli, and vanilla. Extremely complex. Look at the color of the juice. It'll it'll tell you everything you need to know about uh, Van, Cl Van Cleef and Arpels gem. What a fragrance. What an absolutely beautiful fragrance this is. Probably could have easily been higher on the list even. So, gem at number 12. Number 11. Number 11 is a fragrance that totally blew me away. Best from the house, hands down. Best from the house. Uh, and I've smelled a couple from this house. This is the best. For, for vintage tastes like mine, this is the best. This is called uh, Futuros. And Futuros is from a house called Abusin. So Abusin is the house. And this color and almost, um, almost like theme, if you will. It's almost like spray painted on there. I don't know if you can see. 
but it's almost like spray painted on there, right? So this sort of color code that they went with, um, you know, you can see, look, it's not really like plastic. It feels like it's, it looks like plastic, but it's like spray painted on there is what it feels like, right? That is a great feel for the fragrance. Oh God. And <laughs> it is uh, out of this world good. I can't, again, another one, just like Gem. I can't believe more people don't talk about this. This is um, uh, floral and green and um, Futuros is, so Futuros is um, sort of this, think of um, this sort of leathery fougere, okay? Um, think of things like, uh, well, it's going to come up very soon. I was going to say, I'll, I'll say it anyways. It's Francesco Smalto's Pour Homme. If you know Francesco Smalto's Pour Homme, you know how it has that very, um, sort of, uh, this almost like a traditional Italian sort of opening, right? But in a fougere structure, but with this smoky oak moss and leather in the base. There's a little bit of that here, the smoky oak moss and leather in the base, but but what they've done is, is they have amped it up with these extreme spicy notes. So you get this, um, you get this clove and you get this, um, this, this spicy woodiness that tends to come through. And when you blend it with the leather and that traditional fougere DNA, Man, I absolutely love it. I, I honestly, the best way to describe the smell is the bottle. The bottle, the color code, that sort of sparkly, it's, it literally smells like the, like the color of the juice in an 80s, um, in an 80s style. I think there's a little bit of this old school carnation in here, which makes it slightly green and, um, spicy, right? It's green, spicy, leathery, but in that fougere sort of um, outline, if you will. But there's nothing. I've never smelled anything that smells like this. The clove, the clove is big, okay? So the clove is a big part of this. And if you don't like clove, you may not like this, but it's so brilliantly blended that even if you didn't like clove, I would tell you to, to try it. I mean, I would tell you to, to try to, to test it out. Man, the clove and the leather and the tonka and that smoky oak moss in the base, so good. I can't believe that doesn't get more love in the uh, vintage community. Okay, so next on the list. Next on the list is going to be number 10. So we're in the top 10. Number 10 is a Creed. And it's probably one of the best barbershop fragrances of all time. Some people say it's actually the, um, some people say it is actually the, um, the best pure Bourdon done Creed, okay? I, I don't know what I would say. I don't know. Uh, I have a hard time placing it as my favorite Creed because there's Creeds that are above this, but I could say that this is probably one of the best barbershop scents that I've ever smelled, and it's uh, Bois du Portugal. Bois du Portugal is a fantastic barbershop scent. Um, it is lavender with basil and a ton of citruses in the top, extremely inviting citruses. Bergamot, lemon, lime, mandarin orange. Uh, Pierre Bourdon is the perfumer for Bois du Portugal. And they've added clove, coriander, nutmeg, Pimento, if you know sort of the way that the pimento is executed in, um, if you know the way that pimento is executed in, man, it's so, so uh, lemony and energetic in the opening. It's so fresh and there's almost like this, um, this blend between youthfulness and this experience. You know, it's almost like a man who still has youth to his image, but has tons of experience under his belt. That's that's what the fragrance reminds me of. And it has that, um, 
It has that cedar wood, sandalwood, ambergris patent that Creed is known for. You know, that sparkly cedar, am uh, sandalwood, ambergris. And there's a little hint of shaving foam. You know, a little hint of the shaving foam sort of freshness, if you will. It is fantastic. There's a little vetiver, a little bit of um, patchouli in the base as well. And, you know, I have a theory on this scent that uh, when Pierre Bourdon made this scent, he was working for Takasago, which is a Japanese uh, oil house. Sort of like uh, Fermanish, but they're a Japanese house, okay? And um, because he was working for Takasago whenever he created this scent, I think they basically retained the right to continue to supply the oils that Creed was using to, to, to make the scent. That's my understanding of the of the system anyways. And I think because of that, because of the fact that uh, they remained in, in control of supplying the oils, um, this, this particular fragrance, like, and I've had an older bottle. I went through a, um, I went through a four ounce, I believe it was a four ounce. It might've been a 75 mil, but um, I think it was one of the big boys of, of, of this, but a vintage bottle, an older bottle. And I can tell you that this bottle right here, which is a 2018 bottle, is still, it still holds up well. So if you're gonna buy a modern Creed and you're worried about Creed reformulations, this is the one of the ones that I could still recommend. Bois du Portugal. Okay, next on the list is going to be a Giorgio Beverly Hills fragrance. And this is called Giorgio for Men. VIP Special Reserve. Giorgio for Men, VIP Special Reserve. Discontinued, okay? But man, this fragrance has some uh, amazing um, bits to it. It's spicy, it's woody, it's leathery, it's aldehydic. The um, spices are cardamom and this uh, very spicy carnation. And the carnation really pops here, as does the patchouli. You're gonna get a big hit of patchouli. But not like, um, it's a little different from the way that the patchouli and the honey is used in the original uh, Giorgio for men. This special reserve focuses a little bit more on different aspects. You don't get the honeyed aspect like you do in the, um, the original uh, Giorgio for men. That's much more honey patchouli to me, kind of like uh, the old school Givenchy gentleman from 1974. This is much more focused on sort of the woods, the cedar. There's a beautiful iris note in here with this leather. Oh man, the leather and the moss and the and the very elegantly done sort of benzoin vanilla combo in the base. Just fantastic. Sad that that's discontinued. Um, so that's number nine. Number eight, and I mentioned it earlier. But here it is at number eight. This is Francesco Smalto Pour Homme. Francesco Smalto Pour Homme is basically a, it's a Italian style fougere. So it opens up with, uh, a, the Italians love their fragrances to open up with lots of sort of bright citrusy freshness, okay? And the way that the uh, bergamot mixes with the lavender in the top of this is, an ex is to me an extremely Italian opening. It has this um, this sort of freshness to it. And the Neroli helps with the freshness, but there's heavier notes. There's tarragon, which I absolutely love. Uh, adds a slightly anisic quality with rosemary, which makes it slightly oily. And there's actual anise as well with cyclamen, patchouli, cedar, geranium, and carnation. And then a base of that sort of smoky oak moss with uh, leather, musk, tonka bean, and amber. And so this gets compared to Enrico Coveri Porom. This is much better than Enrico Coveri Porom. As far as I'm concerned, I love Francesco Smalto um, from 1987. Sad that this is discontinued. Apparently there's versions with like lines in the cap. I, I don't care. Get whatever you can get. This version, the version with the lines, I think they're all amazing. Okay, so that is number... Eight. Number seven. This thing skyrocketed up the chart. Actually, this could even be higher before I finish the bottle, but I love this stuff. This is just a DNA that speaks to me. I've talked about the different fragrances that sort of, sort of share this DNA, and this was inspired by 
Davidoff's Zeno, which came out one year before this in 1986. This took Davidoff's Zeno and, and ran with it basically one year later. Uh, it's, it's from the house of Etienne Eigner, and it's called Free Life. Free Life, I'm in love with. I, I actually should get a bigger bottle. Um, it's spicy, it's woody, it's got lavender, muscat grape, very interesting note. It's almost like this grape wine smell with rosewood, which is fantastic in this fragrance. I love rosewood and perfume, and here it's done to perfection with bergamot, geranium cedar, rose, lily of the valley, amber, patchouli, vanilla, and sandalwood. If you've smelled Davidoff Zeno, you'll get an idea of, of Free Life. Free Life is definitely inspired by Zeno. There's almost no question about it. And this Zeno and Free Life then went on to inspire things like Guerlain Heritage and um, Scott of Poor Home and stuff like that. But um, there, there is no doubt this took its cues from Zeno, which very interestingly enough tried to recreate that... Uh, there's a very interesting Fragrantica article where Michel Almarac claims that they use Shalimar that Guerlainade of Shalimar in the base to sort of create the base of Zeno. And you will get the vanilla in, in the base of both Zeno and Free Life. But it's almost like this barbershop fragrance on top of that DNA. Almost like they, you know, created this, um, this, this monster, this, um, uh, you know, like something that shouldn't have been. They took that vanilla and then they added this barbershop lavender on top with geranium. And so it's like a amber fougere it's literally like an amber fougere because the amber in the base um god it's... some say there's even a little bit of this honeyed aspect of pacoma in here i don't know if i agree with that but i sort of see what they're saying because of the way that the i mentioned that wine like feel in the top right muscat grape wine which doesn't exist, but uh, maybe it should. I don't know. I'm in love with Free Life, man. I'll tell you that. And I will, uh, I'll do a review before this is all gone. And and I sort of bar bought this partial, so I don't have very much juice. It's like right here. And this is only a little 30 mil. So I only have like 10 or 15 mils left. But I will, uh, before that's gone, I'll, I'll do a full review. And then, so that was at number seven. Number six, one of the best sport fragrances of all time ever, ever. Um, could easily be number one on the sport fragrance list if it wasn't for the great Antea sport, as far as I'm concerned. And this is Boss Sport. So Boss Sport is uh, extremely underrated. And I'll tell you, some people get thrown off by the black cap, red cap controversy. Buy whatever the hell you can find. They, they um, I think we're basically the same fragrance for different markets. Um, I don't think there was any reformulation just buy any bottle of Boss Sport you can buy, get it. Mine's made in Germany. I don't care what you can find, just buy Boss Sport. It is one of the best sport fragrances to me. Uh, extremely underrated. I think it's probably, again, a proper fougere DNA. It smells like it has that fougere DNA, but it's bursting with ingredients. There's so many things in here, and you can smell the complexity. Um, some people say it kind of throws back to uh, Monsieur Lanvin style, but in an 80s modern fougere. Uh, I, 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 I've uh, seen many comparisons to this. I've smelled nothing like this. Nothing. There is nothing that smells like this to me. It's uh, fresh, spicy. It's perfect for the heat. Um, it's lemon, mugwort, bergamot, juniper berries, mandarin orange, and marigold with geranium, tarragon, carnation, clary sage, mace, rose, jasmine, and lily with cedar, patchouli, amber, moss, musk, sandalwood, and tonka bean. And um, yes, I mean, probably backup bottle worthy. Although, uh, I mean, shit, I'm, I'm wearing stuff like this and it's going to be 90 degrees today. So maybe I don't need a backup because I don't wear these all the time. Uh, when I want to be sort of season specific, I'll wear this. But man, this is so good. Uh, so classy too. You could easily wear that to the office. Okay, top five. Number five, we have the great, probably one of the best Thierry Wasser creations of his entire career. And Thierry Wasser is a hell of a perfumer, and this is a hell of a fragrance that does not get the love it deserves, um, in my opinion. This is the great Salvador Dali Porom from 1987. Um, it is fantastic. It is... Uh, Sort of a spicy, animalic, um, 
earthy uh, take on a fougere. Okay, so it's uh, got the tarragon, it's got lavender, it's got anise, it's got basil, bergamot, mandarin orange, and lemon, and you'll probably see a similar note listing to what you've heard many a times, but this smells completely different because it has that animalic facet to it. And around this time, Terry Vosser was playing with creating fragrances like, uh, for example, Furio came out a year or so after this, I believe, but right around the same time. Furio is one of the most animalic fragrances you'll smell, uh, and this is a very animalic fragrance as well. Um, and the older bottles, if you can find these older bottles, um, which basically look like this on the bottom, or if you have the box as a reference, they sort of have this gold border around the Dolly picture on the front of the box. Uh, the older ones are more animalic, okay? Uh, and so this has moss, heliotrope, jasmine, geranium, and lily of the valley with um, patchouli, amber, musk, vetiver, and vanilla. But it basically smells like you're smelling a fragrance that has this civet-like animalic touch to it is is what it is what it feels like to me it feels like there's this it feels like uh there's a little bit of koros in a fougere okay and and i think koros is probably a fougere anyways if you forced me to categorize it um but this feels like you get much more of that fougere structure with just a little bit of koros sort of uh slid in there you know um just just koros sort of snuck in but uh man what a I love this stuff. Absolutely love it. I have a backup of it. It is, uh, it's so good. So, so good. One of Thierry Vosser's best works. Okay, next on the list, we have number four. And number four was almost number three. Number three and number four fought each other real quick. And, and number three ended up winning. And number four ended up being this little bad boy. Or girl, if you prefer. Uh, this is... Um, hang on. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Ah, yes. Here it is. Okay. So, this is the Great Venezia. So, it came, it has come in multiple bottles. These are two examples. But, uh, it's also come in sort of the more modern, feminine-looking Creed bottle. This, I think, is a 90s bottle, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and just look at the ambery color of the juice. Venezia... Venezia is basically Creed does, oh, I wish you could smell this. So this spilled on this when I bought this years ago. It spilled on sort of this leather here, and I can still smell it to this day. Actually, for about a month when I put this in my, um, the place where I keep my fragrances, when I opened it up, this is all I could smell. It's that powerful. It is, uh, it is a blessing to wear Creed's Venezia, and it smells like, although with Creed, they probably didn't use the real thing, but uh, it smells like there's real Mysore sandalwood and real ambergris. Those are the two. So this is a simple fragrance, okay? Um, it's bergamot in the top, Bulgarian rose in the heart, sandalwood, ambergris, and vanilla in the base. That's it. Five, ing five notes. Um, it smells like Creed does Shalimar, okay? It smells like Creed took Shalimar, and did what Olivier Creed used to do to fragrances, which is just substitute some really high-end ingredients and jack the price up, right? But this, my God, man. Oh, and, and that's why I had such a hard time putting this at number four and not number three, because another woman's fragrance actually beat this out. But I think that um, the other woman's fragrance that I'm going to talk about at number three I think they actually use the the real ingredients that uh, um, and you'll you'll see once we get there. But don't discount Venezia. If you're a guy, I hyped this when when I realized what it was, and um, some people bought this on my recommendation and basically came back and said, "Yep, you're right. Everything you said is 100% true. It is unbelievable. It smells like it's real Mysore sandalwood. It smells like real ambergris." Um, man, but as a lover of Shalimar, understand that, uh, um, that, understand that, uh, I, I have a penchant for loving scents like this, you know, 
these sort of scents. For women, I, I absolutely adore stuff like this. So um, you may not, but but for me, this is this is this is heaven. I love Venezia, huge fan. It's an Oriental floral um, with that vanilla, heavy vanilla that'll remind you of Shalimar. But what a fragrance! Oh, I wish you guys could just smell this this outer leather right here. Oh, it's to die for. Okay, next on the list we have number three. And number three, again, the winner of the 3-4 battle, and it ended up being Jean Patou's Ma Liberté. This is the Eau de Parfum. I've never smelled the Eau de Toilette, but I hear it's equally nice. Uh, but the Eau de Parfum is... Oh. So there's little hints in of Patou Pour Homme Privé in here. This is a few years before Patou Pour Homme Privé came out, but this is cit Citrus Fruits with heliotrope, and the heliotrope adds this, um, imagine like purple Play-Doh. Imagine that purple color right there, but Play-Doh, right? Where you can just mold it, that's that's how it feels. With clove and jasmine, lavender and rose, cedar, cinnamon, musk, nutmeg, patchouli, sandalwood, vanilla, and vetiver. It is astounding, astounding fragrance. Um, it is. Uh, it, do not let this stop you if you're if you're a, if you're a guy. Trust me. Try this. The lavender, the clove, the woods, the way that everything plays together uh, feels the vetiver. It feels like it was made for a man. Even though it's marketed towards women, even though it has some feminine touches, the jasmine, the rose, even the heliotrope adds that sort of uh, powdery um, play-doh aspect. Um, almost like you're getting a mold taken of your tooth. It's, it's, it's still beautiful. When I wear this, uh, attention will come. Uh, and I don't give a shit about compliments, but attention will come when you wear this. It's just so, it's just so beautiful. People can't take, and, and the thing about it is, um, so it is discontinued, but that's a Jean Carlio. So Jean Carlio, one of the reasons Patou Pour Homme, Patou Pour Homme and Patou Pour Homme Privé are $1,000 a bottle on eBay is because he used real Mysore sandalwood. He used lots of oak moss. He loved that kind of stuff. It's all here. It's just that the women's versions never got the hype that the men's version got. So for 100 bucks, you're getting 50 mils uh, or, or, you know, if you can get a 100 mil bottle, even better. But I mean, you're getting uh, value for money even at 100 bucks. to me is through the absolute roof. Now that these fragrances are starting to come back in vogue, absolute, absolute huge value for money. Okay, top two. Number two. Very tough to do two in one, but uh, they're both masculine scents. And, uh, but the first one is the Great Akitos. So this is number two. The first one we're going to talk about in the top two, Akitos. Akitos is um, a Gerard Anthony masterpiece. It uh, almost won the brief for the great for poison. It almost won the brief for this, for Dior's poison. But uh, it ended up losing out to what actually would become poison. And um, then Alain Delon ended up picking it up and making it Akitos. And Akitos is discontinued. It's one of those, um, it's one of those sort of, long lost unicorns people try to hunt down vintage masculine sort of you know um this is one of those where uh it's interesting i i always like using this as like a um as like a case study in gender because this was almost a women's fragrance and women would have bought it and worn it but since it lost the brief to to be poison it ended up being a man's fragrance, and men wore it and love it. The fragrance is just a beautiful fragrance, no matter wh which gender it's worn on. I think if a woman wears this, the femininity of her skin will make it smell feminine, and I think if a man wears it, more of the masculine features tend to come out. Uh, there is cardamom, ginger, and mandarin orange, with rose, cedar, patchouli, sandalwood, and vetiver, with musk, leather, and amber, and some animalic accord, whether it's castorium or civet. I haven't really figured out the animalic accord yet. Uh, I think it's probably civet, uh, but there may be a little hint of castorium in here as well. It's green, leathery, woody, spicy. Um, you know, the advertisements for Akitos were sort of um, a snake, hence the, so this is supposed to look like a snake's head. 
you look at the snake shape of the bottle it's supposed to look like the head of a snake okay and the advertisements would have like a snake curled coming down from on top um almost like it's ready to strike or it would be like a old like a old school you know crop duster plane flying over the amazon jungle and looking down you just see the greenery of the jungle and just the wildness of it right uh, it has that adventure type vibe um but Iquitos is, I mean, Gerard Anthony, man. Ger you smell this. You smell Azaro Porom. You smell Balenciaga Porom. You smell Cristobal Porom. How can you not, I mean, put him as one of the top perfumers of all time? God. Maybe I should do a ranked perfumer list? Oh my God, that would be outrageous. Maybe I will. Maybe I'll do a ranked perfumers list. Akitos, number two, easily could have been number one. But number one, if you know me, I basically started this list assuming this was going to be number one. And I left it there unless something dethroned it and nothing did. This is number one for me. Um, it just, it it's one of the greatest, I would say, animalic fragrances of the 80s. It has to be number one for 1987. It is the great Lapidus pour on. So I've got the vintage, I've got the modern, and I have a comparison video on the channel if you want to see my thoughts. The modern stuff is still outrageous. Um, I don't know how Bogart Group does this, but they do. But the vintage is something special. It's lavender with pineapple, the true OG pineapple. <laughs> um, bergamot, juniper, tarragon, basil, lemon, honey. Honey, if you like the honey in Boss Number One, you have to try Lapidus Borom. Uh, Oris Root, Caraway, Jasmine, Lily of the Valley, Petit Grand, Pine, Rose, Rosewood, Musk, Tonka Bean, Amber, Patchouli, Sandalwood, Tobacco, Oak Moss, and Cedar. And so almost instantly from the beginning, you get this animalic, funky sort of honey, right? And it blends with these crazy notes that you wouldn't think work. Pineapple and tarragon and orris and rosewood and musk and patchouli and tonka and cedar and tobacco and there's just all of this stuff and there's a big floral heart in here with pine with basil with you know the citruses uh, but from the very beginning you're hit with basically this spicy tobacco honey um and with all of the other fruits kind of playing along man I love this stuff. I, I mean, could easily be a signature scent for me. Easily. Ted. Sorry, not Ted Lapidus Pour Homme. That's from 1978. Lapidus Pour Homme. That's, this is from 1987. And don't be scared to get the $20 just, you know, modern stuff. It is outrageously good. Um, and I could easily recommend this. There's no reason to go hunt down a vintage unless you're just a crazy collector like I am. So, that is my... Top 22 ranked 1987 fragrances. I hope you enjoyed the list. Um, hell, it's, it's sometimes it's hell on taking all these out, putting them back, uh, doing the video just be, for the love of, uh, of fragrance. I, I will tell you that somebody asked me who they who I think the best uh, reviewer is, and I'm sure they were wanting to get my take at whether it was like Sebastian or you know, Zhao, Eugene, whoever it was, right? And I was like, I think I'm the best reviewer uh, because I do it for the for the love of the fragrances. I just want to share these fragrances with you guys. Uh, and I think I'm just extremely consistent. And so that may sound big headed to people, but uh, honestly, I do feel like uh, there are very few people doing it for the reasons that I'm doing it. There, there are a lot of people out there doing it. Uh, but I but I can almost see the underlying reasons being other things, whether it's fame, whether it's money, whether it's act, you know, um, they want the they want to be recognized. Um, and, you know, for me, I'm not trying to be YouTube famous. I don't give a shit about that. I'm not really trying to make money. A little bit of money here and there to help cover for all these damn bottles that I've spent is nice. But uh, that's just to help continue the, the journey and, and the collection. And uh, so I can keep doing these videos for you guys. So to everyone who sent me sort of decants of stuff that I don't have in the collection, thank you. That stuff really does help. And a lot of the videos you'll find, late night insight videos, are stuff like that that I probably won't have a full bottle of. But um, I, I do want to thank the, the community for the support. It's been amazing so far. 
I um I I really feel like I I really feel like there's a hole in in Fragcom for somebody like me to uh, to to do these type of videos and um, and so I want to make I want to make this type of content that no one else is making. So I hope you found this useful. I hope you made some notes on some fragrances to try to go hunt down and uh, let me know what your favorite fragrance is from 1987. I do try and read every comment and write back. So I love seeing your faces in the comments. Please leave a comment below before you leave. So thanks for watching everyone. Cheers guys. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.